spell, Christopher. Learn to spell. Uh, okay. So, uh, howdy there. Um, I see some people joining us now. Thank you. Sorry about the uh, uh, rocky start to the stream uh, there. Um, hello, Mike. Hey, uh, Mike, seeing you're out there in the uh, chat room, you might uh, be able to tell me if you can hear me okay. Is this microphone working okay? Oh, wow, look at that white balance. Goodness me. Thank you, Evelyn. Appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you and welcome, everyone. Um, to our live stream. Uh, for some reason, the uh, pre-arranged live stream wanted me to install encoder software and whatnot. And uh, so anyway, it wasn't going to work. We've gone with plan B and started a new live stream. So here we all are. Thanks for tuning in. I hope Mind, Brain and Behaviour 1 is uh, going well for you. We're only in week two. Uh, and um, in the previous live stream chat window, which was working for such a short period of time, somebody did ask me um, if this is the only live stream that I'm going to do. Uh, and no, this is not the only one. I'm going to do these regularly throughout uh, semester to help you navigate the subject, to um, answer your questions around assignments and certainly around my research methods component of the subject as well. And just really any questions that you have around mind, brain, behavior one, um, not even just questions, even just talking about the course and, and about all things psychology, I'll be checking in all the time. So uh, this certainly won't be the only live stream uh, we'll have lots of opportunities to chat. And more often than not, you'll see me sipping on a double espresso. Double espresso is my jam. Um, and I really need it today. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Wow. So what I thought we'd do uh, for starters today is talk about some of the really common questions that are coming up. And then I'm going to get into the LMS discussion board and ask uh, and look at the questions that are in there and respond to those. And you can also start posting any questions that you'd like me to respond to in the chat room uh, as well, in the chat feed, and uh, I'll speak to them as you uh, ask. So without any further ado, let me open up the LMS and get into the discussion board. As I reflect on some of the common questions that I am being asked at the moment, probably uh, the more common ones are around class registration. There seems to be a bit of a glitch in the system. Uh, and occasionally, people have found over the last week that maybe your practical class disappears in your timetable. Um, I believe the bug is fixed now, but if this does happen, give it a few hours and then check back in and you'll probably find that everything is back to normal and it's all fixed. For anything to do with the practical class timetable, so if you're new to uh, the mind, brain and behaviour one subject and welcome along to all of the students who are joining us just in the last few days, um, of course, transferring from other subjects because mind, brain and behavior one is just so much better than other subjects. Um, so welcome along. And if you do have any questions about practical class registration, so for example, if you need to find a practical class on a given day because you've got a conflict with another practical class and another subject, um, then you need to submit a request for help in the CREMS system, the Class Registration Inquiries Management System. And the details of how to do that are found on the LMS in the subject manual. 
The MBD1 subject manual is in the subject information section on the LMS. Um, and so anything class registration related, that's where you need to go. Um, let's see, what are some of the other common questions? Oh, okay. Um, a lot of the emails I've received this week have been about the research experience participation program. And um, people are maybe finding difficulty in finding enough studies to complete right now. That's fine. Don't worry. Remember, you've got all semester to do it. And there are numerous studies um, becoming available over the next week. And then in the next sort of two, three, four weeks, we'll see the bulk of the studies appear. There'll be over 100 studies there on the Research Experience Participation Program website that you will be able to participate in. There'll be more than enough um, participation hours uh, to give everybody in the subject who chooses to participate in research uh, enough um, credit to be able to get those maximum five credits through the Research Experience Program. Not a problem. What's happening behind the scenes right now is that the projects are being designed. Oh, and there's a synergy here, isn't there, with your uh, first assignment. So when your researchers are designing projects um, and writing proposals, just like you are going to write a proposal for um, a hypothetical research study for assignment one, we all have to write um, proposals for our research projects that will affect, uh, eventually make their way into um, the research experience program pool for first year psychology. So that actually is why I need my coffee today. I was up late at night last night um, finishing off a research proposal. And that research proposal is being submitted to a human research ethics committee that will scrutinize uh, the research. So as part of that proposal, I had to um, provide a, a literature review and uh, based on that literature review, develop the science underpinning the study and the science underpinning the, the logic, the rationale for the study, the types of measures that I'm using in the study um, and um, everything from the instructions that participants are given to the reimbursement to participants, the procedure for the study, the wording of communications, this all has to be vetted um, and rightfully so um, by at least one human research ethics committee, generally because all of my research is um, higher risk, we would say, clinical in nature, it goes through two research committees at a minimum. A minimum. Um, so if you're agonizing over your research proposal, uh, believe me, you're not alone. We're all doing it. And the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why we do have assignment one in the form of a research proposal is because it is a practical skill that you will be using throughout your life if you get into academic work in psychology and uh, work in psychological research uh, in any way. So long story short, all of those um, project proposals are currently being scrutinized by the uh, Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences and the Central University of Melbourne Ethics Committees, and when they get approval, then they can start to collect data. In other words, then they can advertise their projects on the REP website, and you can learn about them and participate in them. Okay, so that's REP. The take-home message is there's no need to panic just yet, but certainly, um, Keep your eye out for studies. And if you haven't registered for REP yet, then um, uh, read about uh, REP in the subject information uh, manual 
and uh, you can make up your, your mind about whether or not you'd like to participate um, and gain credit towards Mind Brave Behavior 1 and um, follow the instructions provided in the REP section of the LMS to go and sign up. Okay, so here I go diving into the uh, discussion board, the general discussion. Um, uh, so Joe asks, have there been any papers posted to readings online? Um, I'm not sure. One would find that out by going and having a look in readings online. Um, and I might be able to see things that you guys can't see. We've certainly got the folders there. I'm not seeing any readings just yet. So readings online is where we will place um, readings for you that are affected by copyright issues. So um, certainly not all of the readings will need to go there. By now, you'll certainly know from Jason that most of the written content that he's given you are bespoke commentaries that he has written, and therefore they do not need to go up on readings online. But when we get to um, practical classes, for example, or other um, areas of the subject where we um, are drawing on literature that's published in scientific journals, then we will make them available through re readings online and we'll be sure to tell you um, if there's something there that you need to go and read before a class or in an accompaniment with a, an assignment or a class or something like that. Okay, so Natalie asks about lecture slides. Oh, but answered her own question. Okay, so that's all sorted. Um, I've received a few questions about lecture notes, I think, for my research methods modules and whether or not I... Um, uh, whether or not I um, am going to put... I think essentially the script that I speak to in the research methods modules up on um, the LMS. Um, and the answer is no. So I'm going to be a little bit mean and a little bit old school and expect you to take some notes. And there's a really good reason for that. I think, and actually there's a whole lot of literature that will speak to the value of note taking and so forth. Um, in memory encoding that Meredith will speak about in due course, by engaging with the content at that point of intersection with it for the first time, by taking notes, um, it forces you to explore it and to consider it and to work with it in a little bit more depth. Um, and I found certainly in my undergraduate uh, studies that this was a great way to um, to learn and remember what I was uh, being taught in lecture slides. Uh, so I'm not going to put a script up. You'll need to take some notes. And um, uh, each one of those modules only deals with quite a, a, a chunked, discrete topic, doesn't it? So there's not too much there to write about. And you'll probably find that you watch the modules more than once, most people do. And there's plenty of opportunity, of course, to press pause when you want to take some notes as well. And that's wonderful. Back in my day, there was no LMS uh, recordings, no video recordings of back in my day. Am I really that old? My goodness. Um, there were no video recordings. And I used to take a little tape recorder uh, along to, to lectures to uh, be able to record. Um, all right, so questions. Oh, here's another really possible, uh, sorry, popular question I've been getting around online lectures. So um, thank you to Baswit Prakash, uh, who has been helping out with quite a detailed um, explanation of how to access online lectures. Um, Devon, I don't have through this um, 
um, Google Chrome interface for YouTube an opportunity to share the screen. So I'll just try and speak to the questions I'm finding and make sure you understand what it is that I'm answering. I've received a lot of questions about the online lectures that are advertised for say 715 um, at night and what exactly that means, what they are. And what they are is um, the evening lecture, the 515 evening lecture that's been recorded and then published uh, online. The 715 time slot means that you can watch it at any point after that. That's when to expect the publication uh, to come out, the video to come out. Um, you don't necessarily have to be there at that time to watch the video. I understand some people are having some difficulties um, getting SPSS to uh, work on their computer. And in a way, that's a good thing that you're doing exactly what I asked, and that was to go and download my uni apps and try to access SPSS and navigate the bugs right now. So at the... Um, uh, at the uh, My Uni Apps site, there is a link to the student IT, <coughs> excuse me, student IT support department. And in fact, it's um, student IT at uni, no, not at, that's an email address. It's studentit.unimail.edu.au. Um, that is where you can go to get support for tech issues and certainly um, if you're having difficulty installing my uni apps and SPSS on your computer, um, then that is the place to go. Okay, I'm still looking through uh, the general thread here in the discussion board and I can see that yeah, okay. I'm, I can see another question here about the CREM system. And um, this is a question I've received a few times over the last few days. The standard response from the CREM system is that, um, you know, it's an acknowledgement that your query has been received, that you will hear, um, uh, that you will hear uh, something back in, uh, I think it's three business days. So people are a little bit worried about the return time, uh, the turnaround time for their request. Don't worry, CREMS generally works quicker than that. So it's just a safety measure for turnaround time. You know, a worst case scenario, I would say probably about the turnaround time. That sounded very bogan, didn't it? Turnaround time. Um, and uh, generally the, the requests are handled quite quickly, but as with anything else in business, especially in, in a really large organization like the university, um, one has to factor in a little bit of time for um, a help um, system to get back with you. Um, okay, so uh, sure, Carolina, feel free to um, post a question. Um, um, by all means. Marley has a question here. Hi, hi, Marley. Um, do you need to agree with the research question you uh, select? So for example, does contact with people living with mental illness decrease stigma surrounding it? But then the hypothesis that it increases. Um, Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, I mean, there is sort of an implicit direction to that question in terms of the direction of effect. So the way I'd phrase that particular question, does having contact with people living with mental illness decrease stigma surrounding it? Um, Generally, because there is, I think, a reasonably clear um, direction in the question, you would try to embody that then in your hypothesis. You try to maintain 
um, that direction in your hypothesis. So the research question that you have and then that filtered down, very discreet predictive statement that is the hypothesis, they should be congruent. So I would tend to keep them in um, check. Um, um, oh, based on past literature, you're asking. So here's the really interesting thing. Um, uh, I'll give you the, the skinny, the insider uh, note. Now, um, let me just first um, provide the disclaimer that you do not need to consult previous literature in the development of assignment one. I am very happy, in fact, it's my intention that really I'm looking for you to think logically and creatively about what you could do and not get hung up on previous literature at all. So I've got no expectations around consultation of previous literature for assignment one. Just because we're talking about the topic, Marley, um, there are a range of things that have been trialled um, across the world to decrease stigma about mental illness and mental health issues and people who experience mental health problems. And these would be things like education. So education about the problem can help because we generally tend to fear what we don't know about. We misunderstand what we don't know about and we tend to stigmatise what we don't understand. Uh, but certainly um, by and far the, the best, the most effective way uh, to decrease stigma about mental illness is with what's called contact-based interventions. And this is where you uh, establish a scenario where people are experiencing um, mental illness and um, people who are not experiencing mental illness have opportunities to interact and hopefully on an ongoing basis. And that is the most uh, effective way that we know of so far to reduce stigma about mental illness. Uh, so I hope that helps. Um, Marley, my advice would be not to get hung up on previous literature too much, to think about the research question, think about distilling that down into a hypothesis that is coherent with the research question. Um, hi, Carolina. Okay, so in module three of the psych methods, it was mentioned in the quiz that ideally you wouldn't want to choose a topic of research that was done, already done by someone out there. Is that the same for the assessment? No. So the assessment is just an opportunity for you to start thinking um, about um, how to do research. You're not actually going to do this research, right? So what I was getting at in module three there around that discussion um, is that with um, ethics in mind around resources um, and around people's time and money spent participating in your study, probably, um, we don't necessarily do the same project over and over and over again. We would do that to a point because replication is really good so that we can understand um, that if a particular finding is replicated uh, a handful of times, say, and particularly by um, different research groups, and then maybe those research groups also, in addition to the replication, extend the project to cover one new unique thing, then that's a really good ethical use of resources. Um, I imagine that's what I might have been getting at there. I can't really remember off the top of my head, to be, to be honest. But no, you don't need to propose anything that's completely unique uh, or that hasn't been done. I'd probably suggest with the research projects that I or the research questions that I've posed, that it would be very difficult to do that. And again, I've got no expectations of you looking at um, previous literature. The uh, assignment is really to help uh, you explore the first five research methods modules and to give you an opportunity to work with those modules. So if nothing else, it's to help you study, to help you gain an understanding and work with those uh, concepts in the modules. 
Thanks for those good questions. These are great. Um, by all means, keep them coming. And I'm going to uh, dive back into the discussion board and see what else we can find. Okay, quiz for module seven. I'm unable to see the quiz in this module. Oh, that's interesting. Let's have a look here. Um, Okay, module seven. Oh, I am also unable to see the quiz in that module. Okay, that's an interesting one. I will follow up and um, I will get back to you uh, about that Yehudi. Uh, oh, here's another one about lecture notes. Um, oh, are the slides for the modules going to be uploaded? No, again, you know, you can take notes. Um, and um, the slides for the modules wouldn't really be that helpful. I mean, you can always press pause, you know, if you want, but as you would know, so much of the slides or the module video is just me talking um, or it's a graphic or something like that. So probably not uh, all that helpful uh, either. I'm going to leave the behavioral neuroscience questions alone. Uh, I'll leave Jason to uh, speak to those. Okay, so let's talk about referencing. So Cindy Wren has got a great question and that is around how much referencing um, is required for the paper. So referencing, and citation is the method by which you would uh, give credit to original sources of work that you have drawn in. So for example, if you had consulted previous research looking at um, stigma about mental illness, then you could have um, read somebody's work uh, described what they found, provided an in-text citation at the place where you wrote that in your assignment, and then the full reference to the journal article at the end of your assignment. There is another video that I've prepared um, that's available in the assignment folder on how to cite and how to reference the basics. And we do so in what's called APA style, sixth edition, APA style. We'll talk more about that in time, but again, my intent for assignment one is that you don't get caught up in previous literature. I'm interested in your original thought, your original creative exploration of modules one to five. So modules one to five is what you should be um, focusing on and thinking about that. Um, but if you do um, draw on previous literature in any way, then you have to, uh, as in if you cite a finding, for example, you provide a finding from previous literature or say that somebody said something, you need to acknowledge them. You need to um, provide that citation and that's that reference have a look at my video so that you can learn how to work with what we would say is academic integrity. We don't want to get into a place where we uh, start to verge on plagiarism, um, which is uh, generally very frowned upon in academia and more broadly. Uh, and it's all about good practice, learning to be a university graduate is certainly in no small part learning how to um, give credit where it's due for academic work. Okay, so word counts. Uh, I have a question here about word counts. Um, are citations included in the word count? Are in-text citation included in the word count? Yes, they are. Reference lists, however, are not. Again, if you don't refer to previous literature in this assignment, you're not going to need to get hung up on this. Word counts are really important though, 
And it's something that um, probably isn't addressed so tightly in high school. So if you're coming from high school, word, word counts might not have seemed like such an important thing. And maybe from time to time, you might have been in, you know, felt encouraged maybe to go beyond the word count and show your enthusiasm for the topic. Writing to a word count is a critical academic skill um, in psychology and in tertiary education more broadly. There are so many things that will come up in your future career that will require you to build a case for something or to say or explain something in a precise amount of space, in a certain amount of space, and you need uh, to, to rehearse um, that skill to be able to say something, deliver a case, build an argument, tell a story as best you can in the space available, we really push the word count issue. It's a thing that you need to learn how to do. It's part of just the basic skill set of a university graduate. So make sure that you don't write more than 500 words. You will find when you get into the nitty gritty of the policies that there might be some leeway for going over a little. I mean, there is, if you want to risk it, and you'll have to have a look at the fine grain policy and the, you know, the undergraduate student manual and the graduate um, uh, diploma student manuals. But my advice to you is, if you want to approach the exercise and the spirit in which it should be approached, if you want to keep your marker on board with you, because remember your marker that marks your assignment is probably going to be marking somewhere around 100 other assignments that are all of the same length, they're going to know if you're way over the word count immediately. Um, so keep them on board do the task and stick to the word count. Um, and we're only talking about 500 words here. So this is a challenge for you this time to say what you've got to say in just 500 words or less. If you haven't started writing yet, it will probably feel like the opposite. You might feel like, oh my goodness, how could I fill up 500 words talking about this? Uh, but as soon as you start, given that there's so many tasks there, I think you'll get a very keen understanding of just how um, uh, much of a, a task you have ahead in terms of saying things concisely. And to rehearse that, next week's practical classes are going to be all about um, basically rehearsing for assignment one. So choosing another research question, not one of the ones from assignment one, but choosing another one and then responding to that research question in groups in your practical class um, and responding to the same tasks that I've set out for assignment one. So it's a rehearsal, it's a dry run um, at assignment one and the idea is to support your completion of assignment one with that tutorial. Uh, footnotes and bibliographies. These are generally not things that we do in psychology. Um, so uh, what I will um, ask your tutors to speak with you about next week when you're um, having your assignment uh, rehearsal tutorial is talk to you some more about citations. This sounds like a thing that's coming up um, more and more. And um, we'll have some discussion around that in tutorials. So again, if you don't refer to previous literature, you don't need to worry about this at all. But now or in the future, when you do, you'll need to provide citations and a reference list in APA style um, and a bibliography is something that comes from a different discipline. Okay, so a very 
good question here from Emma who asks if there is a required structure for assignment one. So for example, does assignment one need to be completed in the form of an essay? No, you don't need to complete assignment one in the form of an essay. It probably wouldn't work that well. I think it would make much more sense just to set out your assignment um, with a clear, you know, subheading saying that you're dealing with task one now and then task two and so forth. So no required um, um, uh, structure. Don't try to uh, mold this into an essay uh, or a lab report or something like that. That's just going to fall apart. Just respond to the tasks that I've given you um, in the assignment. Okay, so I'm now looking into Um, okay, another thread about word count here. So a really popular theme that's coming up is word count, isn't it? So what I'll encourage you all to do is to go to the subject information section of the LMS, and you already know that the Mind, Brain and Behaviour One manual is there. What else is there is the undergraduate psychology student manual and the graduate diploma psychology student manual. In those manuals, you will find the precise details about what is and what is not considered to be included in a word count in terms of citations, footnotes, tables, figures, reference lists, and so forth. This is information you'll need to know for all psychology subjects. So if you haven't already looked at those, uh, please go and look at those uh, manuals as they apply to you. So if you're an undergraduate student, use the undergraduate manual. If you're a grad student, use the grad dip manual. And then um, you will find, well, actually the same policy applies in either one. So um, you'll find uh, what is and what isn't included in a word count in there. Oh, and somebody's quoted that. Okay, so that's great. Um, oh, okay, so uh, we've got a great question here from Thanamsak, and they ask if treatment X needs to be replaced with a real world treatment. Um, no, it doesn't need to be replaced with, um, you know, like an existing real world treatment. Uh, you could rename it. You can make it um, whatever you like, I suppose. But no, there's not a requirement that treatment X in that particular research question um, is replaced with a real world treatment. And in fact, let me just open up the assignment one document so I can speak directly to it. Okay, so the second research question that I posed was, does treatment X, a hypothetical new treatment for depression, work? So all I've really done there is asked um, a question about whether or not a treatment for depression works. So we know it's about depression. Uh, we don't know anything else. So you've got freedom. Otherwise, it could be a medication-based therapy or it could be a talking-based therapy, a psychotherapy, we would say. Up to you um, to choose there. Excuse me. Okay. So... So that is word counts. And now we have a question about hypotheses. I'm wondering whether or not we need to state an experimental and a null hypothesis or just one hypothesis. You don't need to um, state formally. This is a question from Jessica. And thank you for posting that question, Jessica. Um, you don't need to um, state a null hypothesis 
In fact, I don't think I've even told you guys about null hypothesis significance testing yet. That's going to come in mind, brain, and behavior too. You know, however, that a hypothesis, or maybe I did tell you about null hypotheses. I can't really recall off the top of my head, but a null hypothesis is generally the opposite of what you're interested in. And the null hypothesis is a general idea that there's no effect, that nothing's happening, uh, that there's nothing to be observed. So generally when we predict something, when we make a hypothesis from each of those research questions, you'd notice that the research questions were asking about the existence of something, not about the non-existence of something. Bit mind bending, but I'm always predicting an effect in those research questions. And certainly, so it might be an effect of difference, it might be an effect of relationship or of causation, um, which is particularly tricky to, to do. Um, but you would notice that if you thought about what sorts of hypotheses might come down out of those research questions, they're predictive of an effect. So you'd be predicting that treatment X would reduce depression symptoms, for example, maybe. You want, you want there to be a prediction of effect. You wouldn't come up with a therapy and then predict it wouldn't work and then trial it. There would be no point to that. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so the null hypothesis is just always this alternative possibility. If you're... Um, uh, if your hypothesis, your experimental hypothesis, we would say is supported, the null hypothesis would um, not be supported uh, in your uh, research outcomes, for example, and vice versa. If your research showed there was nothing happening, then that would be um, support in favor of the null hypothesis and not of your experimental hypothesis. I might have a null hypothesis that, um, oh, excuse me, I might make a prediction, I might make a hypothesis that if I walked over behind me there and turned the light switch off, that that light bulb would go out. The null hypothesis, null hypothesis in that instance would be that pressing the light switch would have no effect on the light. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's get back to hypotheses in this thread. Do we need to come up with our own hypothesis or must it be based on the research we have made? A question from Janice here. Um, so yes, you do need to derive a hypothesis and that hypothesis must be based on one of the research questions that I've provided. So um, not making up another research question, but certainly dealing with one of those five and deriving um, a hypothesis from that. You're very welcome, um, Carolina. Okie dokie, so working through, we've just got a couple of threads. Oh, this is a great question. So glad that uh, John has asked this one. So is it possible to receive feedback on assignment drafts, not from staff and not from your tutors. Um, this probably happened in, um, in uh, high school, for example, you might've had a situation where tutors or lecturers would give you feedback on drafts of your work before you actually submit it. That's not the way it works at university. At university, will guide you as best we can en route to you submitting it and support you in submitting it. And then when we mark it, you'll get some feedback that will guide you for next time that you're writing something. That's the sort of the way it works. But of course, there's a very structured way in which we do support you in writing your assignments. And that's by building a range of supports around. The first support is the content, the curriculum upon which the assignment is based. So modules one to five, these provide the fundamental informational support for the completion of the assignment. 
the second part or the second way in which we support you with the um, assignment um, is with the practical class, of course, that's coming up where you'll get to um, rehearse the process of the assignment, albeit with different research questions, and you'll get feedback in that assignment, both, oh, sorry, in that tutorial or practical class from uh, the tutor and from your peers um, about the responses that your group came up with to the various tasks that are in the assignment, but just about these other questions you work with in the class. And of course, the other layer is this, what's happening right now. We're talking about the assignment and I'm giving you some guidance. So hopefully with those things all together, that will put you in a really good position for success with uh, assignment one. And, everyone, and we'll basically repeat this process with all of the other assignments. So, and all of the other assignments being one more. Um, so obviously in the first lecture, I told you about assignment two and that it was about the sensation and perception part of the course and had something to do with visual perception. So you know that the content that Dr. Cropper delivers in that part of the course is going to provide the fundamental support for you doing that assignment. And again, we have another practical class coming later in the semester that's going to support your completion of that assignment where you'll rehearse it again in advance of submitting it. And we'll have more sessions like this, you and I talking together about the assignment en route to completing it. So you'll be well supported. Um, and then the, I suppose the, the um, extension maybe beyond what many high school students might then be familiar with is then based on all of that support and the informa information you have, then owning the assignment and making your own decisions about the way that you're going to approach it and what you're going to do. So not so much a case of um, your teacher reviewing your drafts beforehand, but would provide you with the starting point and then you um, are the boss, you make the decisions. Uh, and you know that's the way that things typically work. Uh, and that's what university study is all about, helping you to develop a skill set to help you um, make good decisions, navigate various things in life. Okay, submitting the assessment. Um, there is a specific way to submit the assessment um, in terms of um, uh, we're going to submit the assessment online via a thing called Turnitin which is uh, a software package that plugs into LMS that allows you to submit assignments to it. We mark your assignments in it. It also checks for um, issues with plagiarism and whatnot. So, you know, um, I'm sure you're all very ethical people and you wouldn't consider plagiarizing other people's works, but, um, there is just no hiding from turn it in. So, you know, years ago, when I was a tutor in Mind, Brain, and Behavior One, we didn't have turn it in. All of the assignments were submitted by a printed paper, and there were little subtle things that your marker would pay attention to to determine if the work was original or not. Uh, and we still do that. So, for example, if I saw a certain style and quality of writing throughout and then all of a sudden in a paragraph and just that paragraph, somebody starts to write like they have a PhD and then all of a sudden we're back to um, an undergraduate level, to, which is to be expected throughout the remainder of the essay, then you know something is, is suspect with that paragraph, of course. Um, you might Google it and find, oh, okay, that's where this paragraph has come from, and that's not okay. All your work that you submit at university has to be original. And speaking of turn it in, there's just no hiding from it. It has basically everything that's ever been published on Google, that's ever been published in a journal article, that's ever been submitted as an essay or an assignment at this university in previous years and universities all around the world uh, so, 
Um, occasionally, we will uh, have people thinking they can cheat the system and they might have had a relative or a friend who did mind, brain and behavior one, two years ago and they submit their work and hey, presto, um, the outcome will not be positive, shall we say. Uh, so make sure you're just submitting your own original work, can't beat, turn it in. And, you know, why would you want to submit somebody else's work uh, either? The beautiful thing about university uh, study is this is one of the few times in life where everything you're doing is all about you. Uh, it's all about bettering yourself and acquiring skills and acquiring knowledge. And the only way to do that is to go through the process. We'll talk more about submitting the assignment and um, the requisite name for the file that you will submit to turn it in or whatnot in due course. Uh, so ooh, somebody's just um, posted a question one minute ago. How exciting. So Timothy has just uh, posted a question. Um, given that some research designs are simpler and more straightforward than others, would there be a restriction on what designs we can choose for our assignment? Or we just uh, pick the design that's most appropriate for the research question. So you definitely just choose the design that's most appropriate for the research question. I would argue that based on the types of research designs that I've introduced you to, which are the fundamental types of research designs, there's not really much difference in terms of complexity amongst these at all. So I'm not looking for you to, in some convoluted way, try and take a very complicated research design and apply it to a research question that doesn't fit that design logically. There's a lot to be said for simplicity and elegance and appropriate research design. Uh, so one of the fundamental things I'll definitely be looking at is um, research design that's appropriate as a choice to answer the research question. I hope that answers that question. Uh, there, Timothy. We've got another question here about treatment X. Okay, is it a drug or is it a cognitive therapy? It could be either. Depends what you want to define it as being. It's up to you. What's the severity of depression? A really interesting question. So that's something you could think about and whether or not you want to standardize the level of symptomatology of depression for people in your um, study or not. Um, okay, so... Um, there's an idea here that maybe there's different symptoms. So uh, John has raised the issue of thoughts of suicide are maybe more common in severe depression than in um, a more mild experience of uh, depression. So what um, is important here is that uh, you're thinking here, John, about variation in symptoms and what implication that might have for your findings. Uh, and that is something that uh, is certainly very important to consider. You could, on one end of the spectrum, be really restrictive, I suppose, about prescribing a certain level of severity of symptoms and a certain type, a certain set of symptoms. Uh, and excluding potential participants who showed other symptoms or none of those symptoms. And at the other end of the spectrum, so that would give you um, more confidence in the internal validity of your study regarding the specific um, effect of the therapy on the specific group of people you had in there. 
if you wanted to enhance external validity more, which is about how generalizable the findings would be beyond your study, then you wouldn't be so restrictive. You'd uh, maybe let a broader range of people into your study. There are reasons for and against each of these um, approaches, and there's a tension there between internal and external validity that you need to juggle uh, to um, come up with an appropriate design. And um, as long as you, I suppose, define the setting and the intent of your study and you um, proceed accordingly with inclusion and exclusion criteria for your study, um, then um, that will be fine. So one of the things I suppose that comes through there is that for this assignment, you want to make sure that your marker understands your rationale for making decisions uh, throughout. Um, uh, John also asks, is there a target population to be studied uh, in terms of um, a particular age group? No, not necessarily. Um, you could, uh, if you wanted to, um, uh, propose a certain target population, but again, there'd be a good reason why you'd want to do that, I suppose, and you'd need to make sure that your marker understand it why and what sort of value it added. Uh, so I'm just looking through the broader discussion on this thread around treatment X, and Sarah has chimed in actually with a comment that's quite similar to what I just mentioned. Um, yeah, so uh, you have a little bit of freedom there to move within the parameters of the research question that's set. Uh, it's all about making sure you understand, firstly, why you're making a, a decision and then really uh, translating your understanding to the to the market, making sure they understand the rationale as well. Um, mm, mm, mm. Oh, and here we've got a repeat question about the um, uh, about replicating previous research. So that's all right. We've already talked about that one, and again, we don't need to go into uh, previous research for the purposes of this assignment, but you can if you like. So I think I have just been through the, um, that's certainly the assignment one thread. Uh, I won't get into the tutorial classes stuff because I'm going to leave Caitlin to deal with uh, those questions uh, in the threads. Um, that's her domain. Um, the Groups for Education uh, program that I spoke about at Lecture 1 is still coming. We've just postponed its delivery a little bit to uh, be able to um, um, A, bring forward the uh, tutorial around the assignment and to give you an introduction that's marrying Jason's neuroscience tutorial uh, and also just do some final tweaks to make sure it's as good as it possibly can be for you. Uh, but rest assured that is still coming. So that's the assignment uh, thread done. That's the entire discussion board thread, uh, threads, collection of discussion board threads done. Did anybody uh, who's out there have any questions about uh, anything to do with MBB1 that they wanted to ask? Now's the time to jump in. Oh, that coffee is cold, but it's really strong. Woo! And it's really good. Um, there is a lot happening uh, around the university in terms of extracurricular stuff uh, at the moment. Oh, one thing that I have been meaning to get in contact with you about, and I'll send out an announcement very shortly about is the Mind Brain Behavior One class of 2019 group photo. So we've found a location. It's going to be 
out near the cricket field because it's potentially the only spot that we could find that would house us all. And I'll be in touch very shortly with um, the uh, time and date uh, and the details of the consent form that you would need to complete uh, to uh, give consent for your image to be uh, used if you'd like to be part of that class group photo. So I think that's it uh, for me for this stream. As I said, I will be holding streams throughout semester regularly. Uh, so uh, I think this is going to be my primary way of keeping in check with you all and, and interacting and speaking with you all on a regular basis. It's a really, I think, um, a meaningful way for us to stay connected uh, when there are just so many of us. We can all be in this same place at the same time or later via the recording. Uh, it's a great way to stay in touch. Of course, there's the vlogs that we're doing as well. We've got some really interesting guest speakers coming up on the vlogs, and uh, these include some of your um, uh, tutors. So uh, we'll be speaking with Sam Saber, who, believe it or not, I taught. I was Sam's tutor when he was in Mind, Brain, and Behaviour back in 2009, I think it was. Uh, and now he's a tutor. He's just getting towards the end of his PhD in visual processing. So he'll be great to speak about how he uses what he learned in Simon Cropper's section of Mind Brain Behavior One a decade later in his doctoral research. Um, we'll uh, be speaking to some other tutors will be speaking to another ex mind, brain, and behavior one student uh, whose name is Dr. Michelle Blanchard, and she is the acting CEO of SANE Australia, uh, an organization that supports people with complex mental illness. And uh, she'll be talking to you about her experience coming out of mind, brain, and behavior, and then her journey all the way through to leading this huge national organization that does so much good for so many people. And we've got a range of other um, people that have got mind, brain and behavior, uh, subject related experiences and whose work intersects with it in some way. And more broadly, I'll just be jumping online to hang out and say hi. So uh, that's it for today, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. And uh, I will uh, speak with you all again very soon. All right. Take care.